The revolution we need, the leadership we have. Revolutionary greetings. I just received issue number 170, and so I wanted to express some of my thoughts of this issue. The revolution we need, the leadership we have. First, what was powerful was when I opened up the paper and seen the vivid uncut portrayals and the pictures of America's dirty work. I have seen these pictures before in past issues of the paper, but to see the collage of horror all together was a powerful message. And I could relate to many of the pictures. The picture of the police smashing a black youth's neck with his knee. I have been in that exact position more than once out in society and here in American gulags. In the barrios or ghetto projects, police brutality is a fact of life and begins as a rite of passage to youth of color. Police brutality is used as a mechanism of control to the potentially rebellious youth of color. The picture of the Iraqis being rounded up and arrested by blatant material force is a perfect example of a police state. We experience the same thing here in the U.S. This is what Latinos and Blacks go through in their neighborhoods. The only difference is the uniform the oppressors wear. The picture of the L.A. rebellion always puts a smile on my face. Cry for the people rising up on that day. When the 92 riots kicked off over the Rodney King verdicts, I was in California CYA, reformatory school at Preston, and I remember when the riots began, the guards put us on lockdown with no movement in the whole institution for fear of all of us rebellious youth at that time raising shit to our captors. I was already in the hole at this time for some other mischief, but I remember being in this dungeon and talking about the riots in L.A. As we heard about it, and even though at that time none of us had studied revolutionary struggles or theory, we didn't know the root cause of why the ruling class cast us off. We didn't even know what the ruling class was. But we did know we were happy and excited. We knew instinctively that what was taking place in LA was not only right, it was a beautiful thing and we wanted in. I remember me and my neighbor who was underneath me in the cell below me would talk out our window and we would go on and on about what we would do if we were out and in the uprising. I always look back at that situation and it solidifies the position that should a revolution reach these shores, the millions of youth such as we were in that dungeon would rush to partake in the struggle. Even without being fully immersed in political science, they would instinctively know that the people were correct. As the article says, fight the power and transform the people for revolution. Well, what this means is the power is the ruling class, the imperialist. Transforming the people is changing this bling-bling society, the slave mentality, the heavy chain of religion, the self-destruction that is planted on our minds as youth from this society, the defeatism. All this needs to be shown to the people, and not only telling them that's wrong, but showing them why that's wrong thinking, and then showing them what a better, more revolutionary way of going about it is needed. Where does this culture come from? And who benefits more out of it? These questions need to be grappled with so that people can see the truth, the righteousness of where you're coming from, and in this way you will transform the people so that revolution is possible. In the article it speaks of for a revolution there must be a revolutionary people among all sections of society, but with its deepest base among those who catch hell every day under this system. Well, I don't need to catch hell, as hell is my solitary, concrete ossuary 24-7. But there's many more, whether in a cinder block gulag or a ghetto block gulag. We have nothing to lose but our chains. But even here, it takes transformation to grasp the true nature of our conditions. I have come to see over the years that this newspaper is an excellent educational, people-building, organizational tool within the prison system. With it, dialogue has opened, seeds have been planted, and lines have been sharpened on many fronts. The thing about what I have been able to study of Bob Avakian is I not only see the chairman of the RCP in his writings, but I see a genuine revolutionary. I remember reading his memoir from Ike to Mao, and I seen all the people he struggled with over the years and many setbacks and targeting by the police as well as the feds, 
where many have fell off of ex out of exhaustion, police harassment, or incorrect political line. A vacant has remained firm in his struggle for the people. And this article that came out in issue 170, it said how a vacant has given his heart for these struggles and how he studied and developed scientific theory for making revolution. But something this article does not say is that Avakian did not have to take the revolutionary road, the strenuous trek to struggle with the oppressed. Avakian grew up with a father who was a lawyer and then a judge. He was going to pre-med. He could have easily stayed in school, got the plush doctor job, the Corvette, the model wife, and lived high in the suburbs, tucked away safely, free from the crime-ridden areas, street people, and criminal elements, basically the downtrodden and cast-offs. But he chose to struggle with the people, those who grew up in dramatically different living conditions. And so he was in turn harassed with the people, jailed with the people, and he continues with the people. So there are lots of contributions Avakian has made to the international movement, but this is what stood out to me as someone I should and have looked into more deeply.